our workshop today is with Lucy A. Snyder, and she will be presenting And Then the Murders Began, writing great first paragraph. Lucy, a, Lucy Snyder is the Shirley Jackson Award nominated and five time Bram Sto Stoker award winning author of 15 books and over 100 published short stories. Her most recent books are the collection Halloween Season and the forthcoming novel The Girl with the Star Stained Soul. She also wrote the novels Spellbent, Shotgun Sorceress, and Switchblade Goddess. The nonfiction book, Shooting Yourself in the Hand for Fun and Profit, A Writer's Survival Guide, and the collection, Garden of Eldritch Delights, While the Black Stars Burn, Soft Apocalypses, Orchard Carousels, Sparks and Shadows, Chimeric Machines, and Installing Linux on a Dead Badger. Her writing has been translated into French, Russian, Italian, Spanish, Czech, and Japanese editions and has appeared in publications such as Asimov's Science Fiction, Apex Magazine, Nightmare Magazine, Pseudopod, Strange Horizons, and Best Horror of the Year. She lives in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, her website and her Twitter are on the agenda if you would like to uh, learn more about Lucy. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lucy now. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, would it be okay to have everybody kind of introduce themselves? Uh, what I would like to know is basically uh, kind of where you're at in your writing um, and what you hope to get out of this session. Sure. Um, I'll let everybody else start. I'll go last. <laughs> okay, you wanna go? Go ahead. Okay, I don't mind go. going. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Sunny. I am a poet by something. I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but I am working on a novel. And so I'm, you know, I'm trying to, it's not the same skill set. So that's where I am with it. Okay. I'm a beginner. Okay, very cool. Hello. Oh. Um, I'm Anka Hodenka. I also am a poet. Um, I'm, I'm here because I think first lines are important no matter what they're writing. <laughs> Always looking to sharpen those skills. My name is Sandy Moffat. Um, I am also a poet, but I also write uh, short stories and women's devotionals, and I'm working on a couple of children's books. Hi, my name is Bill Galbraith. I'm in, uh, in the middle of a series of novels, and um, who doesn't like a good murder mystery? <laughs> So in, in every one of my novels, somebody has to die. Very cool. Um, I'm Jeanette Green and I write um, romance fiction. And no matter what I read, um, the first paragraph is always key. If it grabs me, then I keep reading. If it doesn't, then I probably won't. So I wanna write great first paragraphs. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Joanne Schmidt. And I'm a poet, uh, and I'm not very active right now in my poetry, but I'm reading a lot of books, just very wide reading and eclectic reading, and I'm enjoying that part. So I'm just not really writing right now, but I am an active member of the group. Okay. Um, I'm Shelley Evans, and I'm also a poet, and I uh, am working on one that about the um, morning glories out back trying to make the ugly bush next to it beautiful. I might just make a twist in it that eventually it's gonna kill the bush. So we'll see what happens after today's session. <laughs> Hi, my name's Gary Evans. I'm a very beginner. Um, I've written part of my memoir, which was in the pathway to my heart so it was very exciting when I when I got that published since that was my first thing and I'm continuing to add to that right now so that's my focus is the memoir but in between I'm trying to I'm writing um, other poems which I get Shelly to help edit and look over for me before I present it and make myself look like an idiot, <laughs> um, which I'm not, but 
but thank you for having me and I appreciate the education they get from this um, from this group because I learn from everybody and I'm going to continue to learn and because um, she said I needed an outlet because I have a morbid disease so um, this is my outlet so sometimes it might not sound too good but um, but anyway, mm -hmm. sometimes I talk too much. <laughs> so I'm Phyllis Walker. I've just finished my sixth uh, cozy mystery um, up on Amazon, not yet in print, but um, I have been um, doing a lot of writing in the last eight years. <laughs> okay. I'm Laura Steinke. I'm a fantasy novelist and I'm looking to write a great first paragraph. <laughs> Holly Willoughby. Um, I am actually a psychology theorist, <laughs> so I've written some stuff up on Amazon, and um, it's kind of like a series of books that tie together the information for my theory, and I'm also a poet. I found the group online, and I'm interested in learning more, so... Anyone else? Makiba? Oh. We'll, we'll go. Um, Terry and Carol, Willie and Baker Willie. Um, and we've been writing together for years. We're OGs from Kern, uh, the Writers Club, and we're currently located at Coastal Dunes uh, Writers Club, but we still like to drop in here. And we're writing novels, um, science fiction, fantasy, primarily, occasionally a nice mystery. Um, what else you got going? Romance. Romance. Um, a little bit of everything. Some short stories, occasionally poetry. Oh, we have a hand raised. I see a hand, hand raised. raised. Hi. <laughs> Did you want to introduce yourself? Oh, please, yes. My name is Jack. I am an active member and Dagny Coffee is where a bunch of artists, local musicians get together and we just uh, express ourselves. Uh, I've been writing poetry since I was 16 years old and it wasn't until these, this past year, I decided to have the courage to actually uh, submit my pieces and to actually to perform. And I heard, I found the group on Twitter, Writers of Kern. And as soon as I found out there was an event involving you specifically, I had to, uh, participate in it. I'm hoping to learn a lot from you tonight. Okay, cool. Makiba? Hi, my name is Makiba Lyons and I've been a part of um, the Writers of Corn for years. I've written um, three novels, have not successfully gotten them published. It's just a, a me getting stuck thing, but um, I enjoy writing novels and also screenwriting. Okay. Carla? Hi, I'm uh, Carla Rivas, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I'm a photographer and a writer. And my current fun thing to do is I'm newly retired and I take, um, well, I've been taking pictures for years, but I'm a short story writer. I, t I take pictures and then I research the area and I create a fictionalized, a fictionalized story based upon the history of the area associated with the photograph. Thank cool. you so much for being here today. Sure. Anybody else? Uh, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Cindy okay. Rodriguez. I'm the president of the Writers of Kern. You all know me or should know me. Um, I write um, multiple genres. So I write speculative fiction, but I also write uh, contemporary as well. I'm working on a novel too. I have um, some books out um, published through West 44. <laughs> I'm also a poet and um, yeah, that's it. Okay. 
All right, um, just to kind of set everybody's expectations, um, the examples that I'm gonna be using in this session are largely going to be from short stories and they're largely going to be from uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror stories. They're all available on the web. I did look for some mystery examples, uh, but those tend to be behind paywalls, uh, at least the, the recent award winners. Um, but um, these stories should be applicable regardless of what genre you're specifically writing in. Um, and if you have questions, if you feel like we get to the end of it and, and you're still like, I have questions that were not answered in the course of this, then we can certainly talk about that. I'm hoping that at the end, if anybody has um, a first paragraph in progress that they'd like to get a brief workshopping run while everybody's live on here, we could totally do that if you want. And if nobody feels like offering themselves up as a sacrifice, you don't have to. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody gets what they wanted to get out of this session today. So, you know, at the end of it, don't be shy. And if you have any questions, um, I might not see the hand raised, but if you can just uh, use the uh, chat feature and type your question in there, I can go ahead and try to address it. So uh, any questions at the outset before I get started? Okay. Okay, so uh, cutting to the uh, title of this, and the murders began writing great first paragraphs. Author Mark Laidlaw once wrote, the first line of almost any story can be improved by making sure the second line is, and then the murders began. And while this is often very true, most writers can't actually use this technique. For instance, if you're writing a romance, probably you're not going to want a whole lot of murder unless you're, you know, writing a cozy romance mystery hybrid. Uh, but anyway, in this session, we're going to discuss the first paragraphs of recent award-winning short stories to show why and how they work to hook readers. Um, sort of cutting to the basic purpose of a first paragraph. The goal of the first paragraph of any story is to engage the reader, convince him or her that what they have before them is going to be an interesting story, well told, and to convince them to keep reading. Uh, basically, and you can extend that out to every other paragraph in the story, is you want to keep the reader convinced to keep reading until they get to the very end, right? Um, your first paragraphs makes a narrative promise to the reader about the kind of story they have in front of them. If your first couple of lines are action packed, you're basically telling the reader, you think this is exciting? Just wait, wait there's more coming. This is going to be great. There's the expectation that the story will escalate or otherwise grow from whatever promise you make in that first paragraph. Now, you can break that promise later for a narrative effect. Um, you, you can do a major switch up in the middle. You can have some kind of a twist, um, but the payoff has to be worth it to your readers so that they're not going to get to the end and feel cheated and feel like, okay, I thought that this story was going to be one thing, but it turned into this other thing and I'm just not satisfied. You want to really avoid that if possible. Um, the reality is that you must hook and hold a reader's attention with your opening lines. A person who's picked up a magazine or book will generally give your your story a page or two before they decide your narrative isn't for them. But unfortunately, an overworked slush reader for um, a magazine or a publishing company will not. For instance, if a junior magazine editor is reading submissions at 3 a.m. and she still has 50 stories to go to clear her queue, she's gonna be looking really hard at those first paragraphs. And if they don't engage her, if they don't display the level of craft that she and her senior editors are looking for, she doesn't read, oh, sorry about that. She doesn't read any further. Um, did anybody lose me? I can go back and uh, read more slowly. Anybody? Okay. The only thing I was trying to hear was you said something about, I guess it's all about the first paragraph, but it, the first paragraph, it was a, never mind. Okay, no worries. I can, I can back up. So basically, your first paragraph makes a narrative promise to the reader about the kind of story they have in front of them. If your first couple of lines are action packed, you're basically telling the reader, you think this is cool? Just wait, there's more coming. You're gonna get more of this and it's gonna be even better. There's the expectation that the story will escalate or otherwise grow from whatever promise you make in that first paragraph. You can break that promise later for narrative effect. The payoff has to be worth it to your reader so they won't feel cheated. Um, your, your story ultimately has to be satisfying to the reader. And if you promise them one thing in the first paragraph and you created some kind of twist in the middle that leads them to have a different story that wasn't quite what they were wanting, um, then that's a problem and you want to avoid that. Uh, the reality is that you absolutely have to hook and hold a reader's attention with your opening lines. 
A person who's picked up a magazine or book will generally give you a page or two before they decide your narrative isn't for them. I mean, if you're writing in a genre that's squarely in their interest, like they'll give you a little bit more leeway, but most readers have a little bit of skepticism if they don't know you as a writer. And, you know, they'll be kind of like, eh, do I want to spend time on this or not? Uh, but they'll give you a couple of pages generally. Uh, but if you're submitting to a magazine or a publisher and you're in front of a slush reader or a first reader, they're not going to give you the, that kind of time a lot of instances. Um, there are some magazines where the slush readers have been told, yeah, you got to read it from beginning to end, you know, read the whole thing. Don't skip over. But my experience is that they're kind of in the minority. Um, you will be typically looking at a situation where there's a junior magazine editor who's reading submissions at 3 a.m. and she's got a huge queue to get through um, to get things turned around on deadline. And if that's the case, she's going to be looking really hard at those first paragraphs. And if they don't engage her, if they don't show her that you as a writer have the level of writing craft that she's looking for, she's probably not going to read further. And it seems really, really unfair. It seems unfair that people will be judging your 8,000 word story or your 80,000 word novel on just the first paragraph. Um, if it's a novel, they will genuinely give, give you a page or two, but that's like a tiny portion of a whole story. Um, but I guarantee you that most everybody who reads submissions on a regular basis uh, can get a pretty good sense right off the bat whether the story in front of them is likely to be publishable, publishable or not. And this is going to be highly dependent on the publication in question, right? Like something that is like objectively a publishable story won't be publishable by every market that's out there. They will have their own different requirements. They'll be looking for their own different styles, things like that. Um, but most people who do this a lot have found that stories that dramatically improve past the first page are so rare that most submissions readers aren't going to invest the time and energy in reading the rest unless they have some other reason to. Like for instance, if they recognize your name, they will give you a little bit more leeway. If they've read a story by yours in the past and they enjoyed it, um, they will give you more time. They will give you more pages before they make a decision. Um, if you've been in the situation where you got a positive rejection from a market where they said, but, hey, this wasn't for us, but send us something else. Um, the first thing is you definitely want to send them something else um, as soon as you reasonably can. You don't want to rush it and send them something that's like not completely finished and not completely ready to be seen. But you don't want to wait so long that they've forgotten about who you are and they've forgotten about uh, their invitation. Um, but if they remember their invitation and they, they've got it in their heads that, oh, yeah, I wanted to see something else by this writer, then they will give you a, a more thorough read in most instances um, and, you know, kind of mull your story over more before they give you a reply. Um, there's also a situation where if they have specifically invited you to submit to the magazine or anthology, um, they'll give you more time, they'll give you more attention. That's an earned privilege you generally get with invitation only anthologies. Um, editors are a whole lot more willing to give your story a thorough read and work with you. Um, that's almost never gonna be the case if you're responding to an open call for submissions. Um, and as a side note, I really encourage everybody here to volunteer to read Slush for a magazine if you haven't ever done this before, because this is an incredibly educational experience. Um, it's it's going to drive home for you some of the lessons that I and other writing instructors will give you. Like you might intellectually understand the necessity for a certain aspect of craft after you take a class, but after reading Slush for a few months, you're going to understand this viscerally. You're going to be looking at these, these stories that people are sending and be like, oh my goodness, I've been making this mistake. I kind of like knew it in my head that it was kind of a mistake, but now I'm like seeing it. And I really understand it in my heart of hearts that I should, you know, try to avoid this, do something different. Um, so it's, it's really educational and I would encourage everybody to do that. And you will not find a shortage of magazines who will be looking for some that kind of help. Oh yeah, Clark's World, that's, that's a great experience. Um, uh, Carla asked, is this a magazine? Can you clarify that question? Real quick. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I can send you my notes afterward if um, you're not hearing me or, you know, there's just too much. Um, just like, let me know. Uh, drop your email in the chat afterward and I can send this stuff out if you'd like. Um, 
so anyway, going back to this, uh, your opening paragraph ultimately has to demonstrate a level of craft and storytelling competence. It needs to immediately grab the reader's attention while simultaneously establishing story elements such as time, place, situation, character, and conflict. You don't need to include all of those, uh, but you need to include some. Um, there are many ways to approach first paragraphs, but at minimum, your first paragraph needs to ground the reader in some elements of the setting, establish a viewpoint character, and at least hint at some type of a conflict or some type of a mystery or something going on in the story. They need to hint at what the overall plot might be or might turn into. Um, Okay, normally I had a question. So slush reading is done by all magazines, not the name of a specific magazine, correct? Yes, uh, slush readers are um, synonymous with first readers. Uh, generally a magazine, there are some magazines that are like one person operations. You've got a single person who's reading submissions, who's publishing the magazine and making all the decisions, but most magazines of any size, they'll have a set of first readers or slush readers who will, um, read the things that are sent through open submission to kind of weed through them to figure out what they should send on to the more senior editors for further consideration. And this is just, you know, division of labor. Um, when I ran a magazine called Dark Planet, and it was a pretty small webzine, um, and the, it was non-paying at the time just because I didn't have the budget for that. Um, but I did run reprints, and I got a surprise number of submissions every time I had an open call. And it was really honestly a lot to try to get through. Um, and the moment a magazine is paying even, you know, two or three cents a word, uh, they're going to get 10 times the number of submissions. I can tell you right off the bat that a lot of times for paying markets, they might publish three to 5% of what they get. So you can kind of extrapolate out from there that, you know, if you see an issue that's got like 12 stories in it or an anthology that has 15 stories in it, you know, multiply that out um, by, you know, dozens uh, and you'll know kind of uh, what, they, what they received and kind of what they had to work through. Um, and this is just a side note uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with the topic at hand, but um, I co-edited Chiral Mad 4, which was an anthology that um, I worked on with uh, Michael Bailey a couple of years ago. And 53% of what we got was an auto reject because they didn't adhere to like the central theme of the anthology, which was that we were looking at uh, stories that were co-written. You know, they had more than one author. 53% of what we got had a single author um, and so we just rejected them out of hand because it was, you know, fundamentally not what we were, what we were looking for. We were looking for collaborative fiction. Um, so honestly, if you just read the submission guidelines and follow the submission guidelines and send the magazine what they're looking for, you will have risen above at least half of what that magazine is going to get. I, I was honestly shocked because, you know, we had this guideline like right front and center of we were looking for collaborative fiction, more than one author, and then just more than half of it didn't fit with that. Um, so I, I was I was honestly a little bit shocked. Um, so anyway, uh, going back to the topic at hand, sure thing. Uh, Norma said, thank you for clarifying. Um, while there are many ways to approach first paragraphs, at minimum, your first paragraph needs to ground the reader in some elements of the setting, establish your viewpoint character, and at least hand it a conflict. Um, the essence is the reader needs to get a sense of who is telling the story and what the situation is and what kind of story they have on their hands. Um, the first line is most critical, of course. Um, and those of you who work in poetry know this. Um, and there are several different techniques you can use with your first lines. Um, as a side note, um, in every novel, every sentence needs to belong, in my opinion. Um, in um, every short start okay in, in in a novel every paragraph needs to belong in every short story every sentence needs to belong and in a poem every word needs to belong so you can kind of you know break it down by size um, if you're writing flash fiction you need to treat it like a poem and make sure that every word is the right word and it belongs there um, so in your first paragraphs, in addition to uh, giving the reader a sense of who's telling the story and what the situation is, they need to kind of visualize what's happening. Um, so I encourage everybody to write very specific, very sensory descriptive language. Uh, you don't 
you obviously don't want to start out with like, you know, just a paragraph description, but if something has caught your viewpoint character's eye, you know, describe it as specifically and vividly as possible, but very briefly and then move on with the rest. And, uh, you know, this kind of a juggling uh, that you have to do with all these elements is why writing is writing fiction is really hard and why it's really difficult and why there's so much to learn. So um, anyway, it's a lot. And I realized that, um, you know, when you start thinking about everything, it could be, you know, really kind of daunting, which is why I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the examples later on, uh, that once you get into it, you might be thinking, well, this first paragraph in this award-winning story is doing one thing, but not another. So you can see that there's multiple ways of approaching things. Um, but as I said, the first line is most critical, and there are a couple of basic techniques that you can use with first lines. And if you're writing literary work, you can take a very different approach as well. But um, since I'm gearing this uh, talk mostly toward people who are writing uh, popular fiction, that's kind of where I'm approaching from things. Um, the first type of opening is an aggressive opening. Um, and we're kind of dealing with that with uh, the title of this workshop. Aggressive openings grab the reader by the throat. They hit the reader with an immediate conflict and vivid visceral images. They promise a narrative filled with action, mayhem, or horror. For instance, there's a Dennis Etchison story, a uh, horror story called The Dead Call, and it opens with this line. Today, I rubbed ground glass in my wife's eyes. Now, that's a heck of an opening line. It is not going to be for everybody. It is going to be very polarizing. You know, a lot of readers could look at this and go, you know what, I don't want to read a story about a guy who has rubbed ground glass into his wife's eyes, close the book, set it down, move on to something else. But, you know, it's a clear shot across the bow about the fact that the story is not going to mess around. It's going to be brutal. There's going to be serious horror in this thing. Um, so there you go. Um, as another example in the same vein, uh, Gary Bronbeck wrote a story called Savior that opens like this. I laid out the rifles, loaded the shotguns, and stacked up the cartridges along the wall you know stuff is about to happen and you know it's going to be serious and he doesn't fool around you know we're right off to the races in that first line um and obviously an aggressive opening won't fit with every kind of story um if you open aggressively the story has to deliver on that narrative promise and like i said these kinds of openings are polarizing um and you know if a person thinks hmm i'm not really you know on board with what this story is promising they're going to know about it pretty quickly and they might not read on much more than that first paragraph. But the second thing you can do is to intrigue the reader. The idea here is to tap the reader on the shoulder and whisper something interesting in their ear. Not too much, just enough to pique their curiosity and get them to keep reading. This kind of opening can be a bit mysterious, off-putting, even whimsical. Um, although the writer doesn't establish all the set of information right away, if you do it correctly, the reader will go along with you for a little while before they start asking about the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, as an example of this, I have the first line from Jean Wolfe's Black Shoes. I heard this story from an old college acquaintance, a man I hadn't spoken to for 20 years. I do not vouch for its veracity, but I do. I will vouch for his. He believed every word of it. After you read that first first sentence, you're going to be like, and then what's going to happen next? So he does a really good job of baiting the hook um, and delivering the hook to the reader. And, you know, um, even if you're going into the story kind of skeptical that you're going to enjoy a Gene Wolfe story, you're going to give it a few more paragraphs before you make your decision. So do we have anything, any questions about what I've covered so far? There was a mess. There is a question from uh, I don't know the who the name is. It just says iPhone. Um, it said he sent a direct message by accident. It says so the, okay. so the first sentences foreshadows the story. Is this question question mark? It can. Um, there was a thing that we discussed in my uh, Clarion workshop back in the day that said that, and this more applies to um, short fiction than novels, is that you'll kind of have a resonance between your the first line of your story and the very last line of your story. One doesn't necessarily have to read together, but they kind of have to fit. That there there needs to be kind of an interesting matchup. Um, in in a flash fiction piece, I would say that the first line has a lot more bearing on the rest of the story uh, plot-wise or thematically than the rest. 
but I would say that the first paragraph as a whole in a longer short story kind of needs to do that work. Um, so does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So um, this is where yes. you can... Delay. Delayed response. I said, yes, it does make sense. Okay, very cool. Uh, for this part, I'd like everybody to open up the handout that uh, Cynthia sent out earlier, um, which has got examples from the first paragraphs that I'm going to go over here in a minute. And um, I just, you know, if y'all could just read those uh, along with me, and I might ask for people to volunteer to read since my voice is tending to go out a little bit and I want to save it for the Q&A. Um, so has everybody got that open? Or do you need time? Yes, you need time or yes, you've got it open. Okay, cool. All right, um, these are all paragraphs from a recent-ish award-winning and award-nominated stories in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Some of these are better than others and better is entirely subjective. All of these stories can be found online, which is a lot of why I chose these so that you can go through and read these for yourselves and uh, kind of look at them for more. Um, the first paragraph I have is from Victor LaValle's the, Bla the Ballad of Black Tom, which won the 2016 Shirley Jackson Award. Would anybody like to volunteer to read that aloud? Shelley? Um, you need to get unmuted first. There we go. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. People who move to New York always make the same mistake. They can't see the place. This is true of Manhattan, but even the outer boroughs too, be it Flushing Meadows in Queens or Red Hook in Brooklyn. They come looking for magic, whether evil or good, and nothing will convince them it isn't here. This wasn't all bad though. Some New Yorkers had learned how to make a living from this error in thinking. Charles Thomas Tester for one. So this is an interesting paragraph because it kind of starts big. You know, it, it, it's dealing with a big idea of people who knew, moved to New York always make the same mistake. And the first paragraph gradually funnels down until we reach the viewpoint character in the very last line and he gets introduced. Um, the momentum of this paragraph makes us interested in, we think, okay, who is Charles Thomas Tester? And how is he making a living? And so, so it leads us into the next paragraph and from there. Um, the story opens with a bold, intriguing statement designed to make the reader curious. And also notice the rhythm of the language in here. It's, it's got a really great rhythm. Um, and in the fourth line, Laval establishes that this is a world where people believe magic exists and whether it actually does exist remain, remains to be seen. And this is adding another layer, layer of mystery and curiosity in here um, that's going to engage the reader and make them want to read further. Um, while we don't have a conflict lined up per se, there's an implied tension here because it seems like, okay, is Charles Thomas Tester scamming people? You know, something else going on? You know, what's going on with the magic and, and everything else? Uh, there's certainly implied tension here. And uh, so that's why this paragraph is working. Um, does anybody else have any observations or questions about this first paragraph? I want to know what more about what the mistake is. I mean, I mean, it says they can't see the place, but what does that mean? Right. And that is an, that the answer to that question will be revealed in the rest of the novella. Anybody else? Okay. I do, hi. Sure, go on. I do like how it described the setting and in the most uh, poetic way possible, um, making you engage in the story instead of just so blankly about like, this is New York and and this is uh, how people are. But it was very creative and just uh, describing the setting as well as introducing the character itself. Yeah, he's not, he's using specific place names. He's not using a lot of really visceral language. Um, he saves that for later. But again, it's like he's starting very big. It's kind of like you can imagine the camera, you know, high above the New York City and just kind of zooming in 
onto Charles Thomas Tester there on the street, which is where the next paragraph you find him. Um, I encourage everybody to read this novella. Um, it's about 17,000 words, um, but you feel like you've gotten about 80,000 words of story. Um, it's in dialogue with Lovecraft's uh, infamously terrible story, um, Horror at Red Hook. Um, and I can't encourage you to go read Lovecraft's story ahead of time because it is really kind of awful. Um, but it, if you are familiar with the Lovecraft piece, it will make you appreciate what Laval does in the Ballad of Black Tom much more. Um, but you're, you can appreciate the Ballad of Black Tom even without any knowledge of the Lovecraft piece that his novella is in dialogue with. Um, so that's just an aside. Um, the next paragraph is just a one-liner from Ursula Vernon's The Tomato Thief. Would anybody like to read that aloud? I'll do it. Okay. Grandma Harkin lived on the edge of town in a house with its back to the desert. That's a nice, mysterious first line. Um, as opposed to Laval's opening paragraph above, this immediately introduces the main character. And Vernon places rhythmic emphasis on house, back, and desert. And it raises questions for the reader. Why does she live in such, a, such precarious isolation? What's in the desert? This line creates an atmosphere of mystery and perhaps a little menace. So um, this is a heavily load-bearing sentence. Um, and does anybody else have any observations about this one? The way that um, it's referenced to the house almost makes makes it seem like Grandma Harkin feels like her house is alive because she's personalizing yeah, the house. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, that's in there. So you can kind of see how um, a writer can make a sentence do a whole lot of things. And this is not an especially long sentence, right? Um, so, you know, she's using some techniques from poetry in this. Um, there, there's a lot going on. It, it's a good opener to the story. And for our next example, we have the first paragraph from Melissa Wong's, you'll surely drown here if you stay. Um, would anybody like to read that one? Volunteers? I'll read it. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. Let's see, let me flip over. Um, when the desert finally lets you go, naked and stumbling, your body humming with raw power and the song of dead things coiled underneath your thing for you at the edge of the bluffs. She's dressed in long sleeves and a skirt over her boots, her black hair tucked under a hat and a blanket wrapped around her shoulders against the cold night. Madame Letty's bony horse bluffs at you in the glow of the lantern as you approach. Hopefully you heard that. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So this paragraph drops you right into this world and it's second person present tense, right? Like that's, that's a tense that you're, you know, not supposed to write in, but you know, she does this to very good effect here. Uh, it's telling you that you're doing these things. It's disorienting, but it's also intriguing. You don't know who the you of the story is yet. There's not much characterization or motivation established, although clearly something intense and weird just happened to the protagonist. But you're in, introduced to Marisol and to Madame Letty, at least by way of her horse. Uh, the character names and the references to bluffs and deserts and boots cue the reader in that this is taking place in the American West, or at least some version of it. Um, but because it's kind of weird, we're prepared for it to deviate from what we understand the American West as being. Uh, we don't have a conflict, but we definitely have an intriguing scene. We definitely have an interesting situation that we don't fully understand yet. And the end of the paragraph pushes you to find out what happens next. Does anybody have any observations about this one? Anybody? It's interesting that um, that first portion of the very first line when the desert finally lets you go almost like you can be completely captured and unable to get out of the desert unless it chooses to let you go yes so there's definitely personification of the desert
And it's, I think the horse is warning you not to come any further. <laughs> no, it al also an interesting thing for me is the first line leaves you with a whole lot of stuff that stays with you for the rest of it. You still got the song of dead things co coiled under your tongue and you're humming with raw power, which sets up what's going to happen next because you're already in that, that emotional mental state. Right. And she doesn't use the words magic or sorcery, but you definitely get the sense that this is a world where those things exist, right? You know, the mention of raw power and the song of dead things. I mean, this conveys all of that without, you know, being explicit about it. Did anybody else have any other observations or questions about this one? All right. Um, the next paragraph we have is from A Human Stain by Kelly Robson. Um, would anybody like to read this one aloud? Oh, okay. <laughs> Peter's little French nursemaid was just the type of rosy young thing Helen liked, but there was something strange about her mouth. She was shy and wouldn't speak, but, there was, but that was no matter. Helen could keep the conversation going all by herself. So what does everybody think of this one? Well, it begs the question if there was something wrong with the nursemaid and she wouldn't speak why did helen like her so much we find out in the next paragraph that the nursemaid is very pretty um, ah. um do, what do you what do you get what kind of an impression do you get about helen as a character from this first paragraph she's i don't know if the word is self-centered but she likes to hear herself talk um it seems that she seems yeah. to like it. um a bit narcissistic nurse. i was gonna say that but i'm like you know it's probably overused but yeah yeah um and does she seem like she can observe danger but maybe not pay attention to it like she notices there's something strange about the nursemaid's mouth but is that is that something strange the fact that is it a physical notice or is it something about the fact that she won't talk or that she can't talk um it's a physical thing we find out um and actually uh, going back to jack's question i believe it was jack who asked this question earlier like this first line very much sets some of the themes for this story like some important central themes like the the issues of mouths becomes very very important um in this story uh, and in some ways, this first line does actually end up kind of summing up a lot of the issues in the story, but you don't realize it at first when you're reading it. Mm. Um, we find out um, in the course of the story that Helen is a little bit predatory. Um, she's very self-confident. Um, she's very worldly. Um, she's very self-centered. Um, and these are all kind of... Uh, tragic flaws that lead her to ruin by the end of the story um that helen sees warning signs but just dismisses them throughout the story um and it doesn't come across as a mistake in the story rather than a refle reflection of her character that she's consistently made these kinds of sort of uh borderline bad decisions her entire life but has never really had things go seriously awry um there is a bit of a language barrier, but that's not what's actually, that's not actually the problem here. Um, anyway, um, I encourage everybody to go read the story if you enjoy gothic horror stories, because this one's really brilliant. Um, it was a Nebula Award nominee. It should have won a Stoker Award, honestly, but I don't think anybody on the horror side of things was really aware that, uh, Robson had written this story, but um, there, there's a lot of really brilliant descriptive language in particular in this tale. Um, so that's why I have this one out. Um, does anybody else have any 
observations or questions about this first paragraph? Um, just as clarification, uh, if you could, Lucy, what's the difference between a novelette and a novella? Length. Um, and it depends on who you're talking about. Uh, novelettes are generally going to be 15,000 words to 30 or 40,000 words. Um, they basically occupy the uh, sometimes awkward space between a short story and a novel. Um, for award considerations, for instance, um, I think SIFWA and the HWA, the Horror Writers Association, both consider a novel to start at 40,000 words, but the fact is relatively few publishers will buy a novel that's 40,000 words. They generally want something that's at least 60,000 words, um, but a lot of publishers like Tor.com will take uh, novellas that are squarely between 15, sometimes they put the lower barrier at 20,000 words up to 40,000 words, like that's a good solid length. Um, historically, it's been a really good length for science fiction stories because it gives you more room to do a lot of the world building um, that a lot of uh, science fiction stories really kind of require and high fantasy as well. Um, and the popularity of uh, novellas in terms of being able to find publishers who will print them kind of waxes and wanes where we're in a um, kind of an upswing downswing right now uh, where there are several publishers who will deal with novellas. Um, novellas basically you can kind of use them as a short story in terms of like slotting them into an anthology but they're also big enough to be printed on their own and read like you know um, a reasonable book on their own. So they can kind of uh, serve uh, two purposes. And also frequently in the past, they've been serialized. Um, does anybody else have any questions or um, observations? I don't have a question, but I did observe that the paragraph here tells the difference between the French maid and Helen. Yeah, it does. Like you definitely get the sense that Helen's setting her apart from the French nursemaid. So that's definitely another thing that's happening here. Would anybody like to read the first paragraph from Melissa Wong's Hungry Daughters of Starving Mothers? I'll read that. Okay, cool. Um, as my date, Harvey, Harvard, rags about his alma mater and Manhattan penthouse. I take a bite of overpriced kale and watch his ugly thoughts swirl overhead. It's hard to pay attention to him with my stomach growling and my body a jitter, for, for all he's easy on the eyes. Harvey doesn't look much older than I am, but his thoughts covered in spines and centipede feet glisten with ancient grudges and carry an entitled ivy lead stink. So in this one, we get a conflict right off the bat. The narrator is on a date with an unpleasant man, and although she's eating, she's hungry for something that clearly isn't kale. And this paragraph introduces the weird aspects of the story right away, too. She can see his thoughts, and Wong uses some brief but very vivid imagery in the forms of spines and centipede feet. You know, it's very creepy crawly. It's very unsettling. Uh, we also get some sense of the narrator's personality here through the ways that she sees the man whose name she's not even sure of. Um, like she hates this guy and she's waiting for something. And the first paragraph gives us the sense that whatever she's waiting for might not work out too well for her date in the end if she has her way. Um, does anybody else have any observations or questions about this one? I was just wondering why she was talking to him or with him in the first place if she didn't like him. Yeah, that's a question that gets revealed as the story goes along, but that's definitely a question that gets set up. Anybody else? All right. Um, anyway, um, like I said, all of these are available online and I'd encourage you to read through uh, the complete stories um, if they are something that you think that you would fundamentally enjoy. 
The takeaway of all of this is that you can use the stories you read as your own personal learning texts. You know, mm. dig in and see what you can learn from them. Um, I would encourage everybody to look closely at other writers' works to find techniques that you can use in your own work. Um, one thing I've done in the past and which other people have done to good effect, um, and I want to preface this, that you want to keep these files or these notebooks like well away from your own work. Um, but one thing that you can do to kind of get inside somebody else's prose and figure out how they're doing what they're doing is to transcribe it. You know, just sit down and write out their sentences, read their work aloud. Um, when you read something aloud, you can hear cadences and rhythms um, that maybe aren't really apparent when you look at something on the page. Um, those of you who are poets are familiar with the difference between um, poetry that's intended to be read versus spoken word poetry that's intended to be listened to. And you know that sometimes a poem that doesn't look like much on the page can be really brilliant if somebody reads it aloud. So the difference between reading something aloud and just reading it on the page um, can be enlightening. Um, by the same token, if you're kind of stuck on your own work, I encourage everybody to read it aloud or have somebody else read it aloud to you. And you can kind of catch where maybe things aren't flowing like they should. Um, and you can kind of identify areas for improvement that way. Uh, but anyhow, if, if you take the time to transcribe the work of somebody whose pro style you really admire in an effort to you know, kind of get inside it and kind of take it apart and analyze it more thoroughly, if you wanna keep those, those uh, documents, those notebooks away from your own work because this is a recipe for accidental plagiarism if you commingle somebody else's work with your own work because you might forget in the meantime and come back and find the paragraph and think that you wrote it and then accidentally include it. Um, there, there have been some instances that I know of personally where uh, good professional writers have accidentally done this and it's it didn't result in a lawsuit, but it did result in a lot of awkwardness. So do this, but you know, again, be careful, keep, keep them separated. Um, so that's what I have with regard to, you know, kind of the prepared talk. We can do a Q&A now. Um, if anybody has um, a first paragraph that they'd like to kind of get workshopped here while we have time, we can do that as well. It's entirely up to y'all. Hi, I have kind of a weird question. Sure. Um, it's pretty specific to me. My, my novel is a time travel comic. Okay. And back and forth as to whether my first sentence should be exciting or funny. Can it be both? I, I don't think I can. Well, it should be both, ideally. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure which way to lean because the comment, the humor kind of, I think, usually undercuts the excitement part of it. It certainly can. Um... What I would suggest is focus on not so much the first line, but your first paragraph. You want to make sure that your par first paragraph as a whole kind of captures the tone of the piece. Um, I would encourage you to focus on the excitement, but try to introduce some whimsy so that the reader or acquiring editor knows, you know, what are they looking at? You know, um, if, if it comes off as, um, too serious right away. Again, that's setting a tone that the rest of the story isn't going to deliver on. So do your best to kind of try to work both in. Well, I've already, you've already got me thinking about a couple of new ideas for starting it. So that's good. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Lucy, if you just wanna send your notes to Cynthia, she can disperse them to the whole group. Okay, I'll do that. I couldn't help but think that uh, story about the magician sounds an awful lot like the opening of Aladdin. Hmm. Which one are you referring to? Um, the last one we read, um, The Court Magician. I don't think we did that one out loud, Bill, but I agree with you. You're correct, uh, yes. yeah. Did, um, and I included other examples that uh, we didn't go over. Did anybody wanna go over those or um, what are y'all feeling like?
Uh, I like the last one, but I have a question about like a like a specific, I don't know, exercise or formula you can just use to practice the first line, first paragraph. Uh, could you repeat that? You broke up a little bit. Um, I was saying, is there a, I don't know what it's called, like a, um, a exercise that you can do to try, like a formula almost, to write a first paragraph, a first sentence? Um, like for yourself? One thing, it depends on if you're um, a plotter or a discovery writer. I mean, okay. if you're a discovery writer, you're, you're just going to kind of have to write, you know, kind of sort it out later. If you were more of a plotter where you tend to like to think about things before you sit down to write, it depends on how much of a plotter you are. Uh, but again, it's like you want to go back and, you know, look at what you need the first paragraph to do. And okay. again, there's not one specific you know, formula for this, uh, but look what your story as a whole is doing. Make sure that you are, you know, again, at least introducing your viewpoint character. Um, oh, this is another thing, uh, going back to the difference between short story, novella, and novel. In a short story, generally, you're going to want a single viewpoint character. There are some that kind of deviate from that, but generally, you're better off if you have, like, a singular um, viewpoint character. In a novella, you can have multiple viewpoint characters, same as in a novel. Uh, you know, the longer length kind of supports that. Um, so, um, you know, in a short story, your first paragraph is going to want to introduce your, your viewpoint character. It's going to want to introduce, um, if possible, you know, some of the major themes, either a major theme or get the major plot started. You know, mm -hmm. have a what the story is going to be about. And with regard to plot, like plots can always escalate, um, but you need to at least hint at there's being some kind of a problem or some kind of a mystery afoot um, that's going to engage the reader and make them want to read further. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Bill had a question. Your thoughts on murder as an opening versus as a surprise later in the story. Um, can you kind of clarify that? Yeah, I got to hit the magic button here. Yeah, okay. um, a, a lot of these examples you've given uh, indicate that the key feature, for example, in a murder mystery crops up right at the very beginning. You're aware of the fact that this is going to be about a murder of some kind or somebody dying, um, as opposed to a story that starts on one plot and a murder sneaks in as either a subplot or as a total surprise later on in the story. Just curious, I mean, your thoughts on that kind of a process. I mean, it depends on the story. Um, obviously, if you're trying to sell a story to an anthology of murder mysteries, like anybody who picks up that anthology is going to know that there's going to be a murder at some point in your story. So that's like not going to be a surprise, right? Um, but it depends on, you know, what is the story of your main character? You know, if they're a private detective or a policeman or something, you know, it makes most sense. In, in many cases for the murder to be the instigating event that sets off the plot. Um, but you certainly could write a narrative in which case um, a murder or a secondary murder, you know, creates a twist in the middle. It just really depends on the plot. It really depends on the, the narrative journey that your character is on. Um, so there's like not really one way to answer that versus another. It's really gonna depend on the story. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so did you all want you to go over the uh, last three paragraphs that we didn't go over? Yay, nay, okay, all right. All right, uh, would anybody like to volunteer to read The Court Magician by Sarah Pinkser? I can do that one. Okay. The boy who would become court magician this time is not a cruel child, not like the last one or the one before her. He never stole money from blind Carell's cup or thrashed a smaller child for sweets or kicked a dog. This boy is a market rat, which sets him apart from the last several, all from high-born or merchant families. This isn't about lineage or even talent. 
Okay. So we don't know even the name of the boy who will become court magician, but we definitely know it's the story, right? Um, but the story is more, at least in this first paragraph, is more defining his character by what he isn't, and it implies what he is. Um, but it also gives us a lot of information about this world, because by telling us who he isn't like, he isn't like the last court magicians, we know that the last bunch of court magicians have been really nasty people that they've done probably a lot of evil in the world. Um, and they've all been from places of privilege and we get a sense of this society and it's really kind of not good, but it's also relatable because I mean, if you look back on the entire whole of human history, I mean, we can think of a lot of times where societies were ruled by, you know, uh, unpleasant nobles um, who were doing kind of awful things to the people that they ruled. Um, but uh, anyway, so we've got also another character like Blind Carol is introduced by name. And there's the assumption that, you know, this person is going to play a role later in the story. We don't know yet, but that's a promise that this first paragraph is making that Blind Carol is going to be relevant to the plot. Um, any other observations about this? Yes, Laura. Yeah, we start, we start to wonder what happened to the other court magicians that they need another one so soon. There seems to be an implication that <clears throat> they never really grew up or something. So, right. There's certainly a lot of questions here, particularly since we have the sense this is, you know, not the nicest society. Um, that it's there's the implication that the previous court magicians, you know, met violent ends, and that implies danger for this boy, right? That he's kind of, you know, a cinnamon roll who's going into a role that's been occupied by, you know, violent, you know, aggressive people. So at that point, we're kind of like, oh, how's this boy going to do? You know, can he survive in this kind of world that he's entered? Even though he's described as a market rat, which implies some streetwiseness, right? But, you know, so maybe that mitigates the fact that he's inherently, you know, a kind person. It, well, it also, it also kind of makes me want to know what his journey is going to be like, because he's, he's not going, he's not court magician yet, but somehow he's going to end right. up in that position when by recent history, he sure shouldn't be. Right, so he's clearly got quite a journey ahead of him. Um, and, you know, are, are we inclined to think that this is gonna be a quiet, easy journey? No, there's probably stuff gonna be happening to him and uh, major changes occurring as a result, even in society for somebody like him to rise to that level. So, I mean, this first paragraph is promising a lot. You know, it's promising a lot in the way of narrative in terms of plot, in terms of story. It's saying, you know, hey, there's this kid who's going to rise from, you know, this, this you know, very low position to a high position. And not only that, he's gonna do it despite not being, you know, a violent jerk, like everybody who came before him. So, you know, that sounds like a pretty cool story, right? Like, you know, this first paragraph, it inclines us to be in this kid's corner and to want to root for him and be like, how's this going to work? You know, how is this going to work out? Um, so this, this paragraph does a really great job of kind of hooking you in um, if you're into this type of fantasy story and making you want to read further. You there's know, also... There's also a question, and unless it's a typo, because it's the second sentence says, not like the last one or the one before her. So was the yeah. previous court magician a female, yeah. which would be which would be unusual, because um, usually court magicians were were male. Right. Insofar as we, you know, ever really had any. But yeah, definitely right. it implies that the previous court magician before this boy was female. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that says some things about the society as well. Um, that despite it being, you know, pretty ruthless, uh, women at least can rise to certain positions. So that changes our expectations um, for what's going on in this world. So um, she subtly builds in a lot of world building details in this first paragraph. Well, and not only uh, male and female can be court magicians, but somebody who is, you know, a market rat compared to a highborn, you know, person. It sounds like anybody could become court magician. Right, because it says it sets him apart from the last several, but maybe somebody who was not highborn rose to become. Uh, court magician, you know, decades ago, 
we don't really know how long any of these people lasted in their positions. Um, but it's certainly hinting at, you know, a volatile environment, uh, a dangerous environment, an interesting environment that everybody's operating in. And, and to back up Laura's earlier point, you know, th these are all children. Yeah. And, and what happened to them? Right, exactly. We don't know if they stayed children when they stopped being court magician, but, um, you know, certainly it's, it's giving us a lot of mysteries to kind of drive us forward in the narrative. Debbie, I think you had something to say, but you were muted. No? Okay. Any further comments about this one? Okay, um, would anybody like to read the first paragraph from Carrie Laban's postcards from Natalie? I'll read it. Okay. Of the first six postcards from Natalie, I only have three. Mom was able to intercept the other three while I was at school or after June working a shift at the tractor supply store. I wouldn't even have known about them except that she made sure I knew. Save them until I got home before she ripped them into the smallest pieces her stiff knuckled fingers could manage and set them on fire in her ashtray. She was angry at Nat, but punishing me was the closest she could get now. So this first paragraph tells us a whole lot um, about, you know, what kind of a world is this? Like this seems like, you know, modern day real life world, rural community, right? Because of the mention of the tractor supply store. Um, and we know a lot about the narrator's, um, you know, uh, social class uh, because she's at school, but she's also working a shift at the tractor supply store. So, you know, obviously she's not from a really wealthy household. You know, even though we don't get, you know, uh, specific setting details like the mention of the ashtray um, and her mother's stiff knuckled fingers. Like, you know, we get the sense that, you know, of the kind of house that they might live in. Um, and we get more of those details later, but, you know, you're, you're picturing, you know, like a rural farmhouse or maybe a trailer and, you know, this angry, bitter, abusive mother um, who, you know, might be aged before her time because the stiff knuckled fingers imply she's got arthritis and, and she's probably done a lot of heavy physical labor as well in her life. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of explicit description here, but there's a lot of implicit description. This is one way of doing that. Um, that by describing one thing, you also end up describing another uh, because of the implications that this all carries. And it's not, um, it doesn't specifically say that this character was female. Right. But we, but we assume. Yeah, we assume and we could be, and we could be wrong, but um, do you think that a mother would punish a son in quite this way? I mean, it, it feels like the kind of passive aggressive emotional abuse that, you know, would be inflicted on another daughter. You know, it seems like Natalie got away somehow in a way that angered her mother. Either it was the act of like getting out from under her mother's thumb. Could have been that. It could be that Natalie like took a job her mother didn't approve of or went away with a boy that her mother didn't approve of. We don't know the specifics, but we're curious about them at this point, right? We kind of want to know, you know, and, you know, of the first six postcards, she only has three. Like what was in the postcards? You know, did it matter? Um, what was in the postcards that her mother ripped up? Like, was this important information to the narrator? We just really don't know. Um, but, you know, this was the, the destruction of the postcards was clearly intended as, as punishment, you know, uh, and we learn a lot about the dysfunction of this family without having a lot of real specifics at this point. Um, but this is driving us forward because at this point, you know, we don't know a lot about the narrator's character at this point, but we know that she's in school, she's working at a job, like it seems like she's the kind of person who's trying, you know, to, to do what she's supposed to do. Um, 
but she's in a bad circumstance. So that lends a lot of sympathy to this narrator at the outset, because a lot of us can relate to, you know, somebody being in this kind of, you know, awful situation where they have an angry parent um, who is going to punish us for things that we don't deserve to be punished for. Um, and so that's driving us on to find out more about the narrator, to find out about more re about her relationship with Natalie, to find out what it was that Natalie did that was so angering to their mother, if in fact it was anything at all. Um, so there's a lot in this that um, is driving us forward in the narrative. Um, but at the same time, like if somebody's going to find like descriptions of emotional abuse kind of triggering and unpleasant, like they know now to know out of the story, right? You know, they know now that this is probably gonna get more serious, that we're probably gonna dive more deeply into whatever's going on here with this dysfunctional family. And this is, you know, uh, this is their, their time to kind of like pick up a different story that's maybe about something lighter. You know, we certainly don't get the sense that this is going to be a comedy, right? You know, <laughs> we, we're, we're given the basic tone of the story and the promise that we're going to be getting a lot of, um, you know, relationship information. And we get the sense this is maybe not going to be the most action-packed story, but that there's certainly going to be stuff going on. Um, there's going to be family drama, that maybe there's some sort of a mystery to be solved. Um, does anybody else have any observations or questions about um, this particular paragraph? Looks like Jack has his hand up. Okay, Jack, yeah. What's your question, Jack? Oh, um, <clears throat> sorry, I, that was by accident. <laughs> okay. Um, Sunny B. Uh, just wrote, I have a paragraph I wrote, do you still need an example? Um, we can work through that in a minute um, after we get through the rest, uh, the final paragraph that we've got in here. I can just have one more. Yeah. So did we have any other comments on uh, postcards from Natalie? Or questions? Okay. Um, would anybody like to read uh, Sarah Pinsker's Our Lady of the Open Road? I'll read that one. Okay, thank you. The needle on the veggie oil tank read flat empty by the time we came to China Grove. A giant pink and purple fiberglass dragon loomed over the entrance, refugee from some shuttered local amusement park, no doubt. It looked more medieval than Chinese. The parking lot held a mix of chauffeurs and manual farm trucks, but I didn't spot any other greasers, so I pulled in. So this establishes the story as being set somewhere in possibly the relatively in your future, uh, just in the first couple of words, the needle in the veggie oil tank. Like that's, you know, not a common fuel source for most people who are, you know, alive in the world right now. You know, they're not using diesel, they're not using gasoline, it's veggie oil. Um, and then we read on further, uh, you know, the mention of the refugee from some shuttered local amusement park, no doubt, implies that this world is, you know, maybe a little bit post-apocalyptic at least, you know, that there's some kind of an economic thing happening here um, that businesses have closed down. It, it implies there's been, you know, um, uh, economic hard times happening here. Um, in the last line, the parking lot held a mix of chauffeurs and manual farm trucks, but I didn't spot any other greasers, so I pulled in. So the capitalization of chauffeur uh, implies, you know, a particular role that we don't know what it means yet, but we know that it's an important role, again, because it's capitalized. Um, and again, it's setting this in the future. Um, and the mention of manual farm trucks implies that maybe there's robotic farm trucks. We don't really know yet, but, but it's something that will make us curious. Um, and here in this last line, she says, but I didn't spot any other greasers, so I pulled in. So that's implying some tension, a possible plot issue here. Like, what would the presence of other greasers mean to this character? Like, is she avoiding them? Um, is there some kind of an ongoing conflict happening here? Um, and so, you know, we're, we're given information about the general setting and the general world, and she's dropped in 
some questions that are raised. And so that drives us further to uh, read on in the story. Even just to find out what she means by greaser. Right, or chauffeur, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it, she drops in some in intrigue here and it makes us go, huh, this world sounds pretty interesting. I wonder what's going on here. Um, so in terms of, you know, first paragraphs, this is in some ways weaker. I mean, the very first line implies attention, you know, they're running out of fuel, you know, they have to stop. This is, this is something that most people can relate to. Most people have had that feeling of, oh no, I'm on a road trip and I'm about to run out of gas. Am I going to get stranded? So this is something that's relatable to most people in the world, even though this world is a bit alien to us because we don't live in it. Um, and then at the end, she's added on to that tension because of the mention of the greasers, and we don't know what that means to the narrator, and so we want to read further. Does anybody else have any observations or questions? Well, I was just interested about the word entrance. So what is China Grove? Is it a, is it a, you know, a city? Is it a fort? Is it a, what is it? We don't know, really, quite yet. Um, that's another layer of mystery. It's like we've got some details about the setting, but we don't know quite what we're looking at. So it primes us to read further to get more of that information and find out more about this world. Yeah, just a couple of comments really quick. There's, there's almost a hint of Mad Max going on here. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and the, the other term is, is that the trickiness of using the term greaser, where I grew up and came from, that was a very derogative term. Right, yeah. So, I mean, somebody's definitely tweaking uh, some interest and it could be a very innocent term because she's driving an oil truck, uh, a veggie oil tank truck. So maybe that implies a trade and they're just nicknaming those people greasers. But um, there's, there's a lot of implications here that just kind of make you a little on edge to see what's gonna happen. Yeah, um, I mean, we don't have the sense that this is going to be a super violent story or anything, uh, but, you know, we get the sense that maybe that's not off the table. We we, we have some low key tensions here. There's a sense of uneasiness. Um, there's a sense that people might be a little bit desperate in this world. You know, again, the sense of the Mad Max type environment, but maybe not quite so overt. So we're we're a little put a little bit on edge we're curious about this world and we want to read further to find out, you know, what kind of a predicament is this narrator? You know, what are the stakes of this story? Um, that's one thing uh, that you definitely want to do in the first page of your story. This kind of goes beyond, you know, the first paragraphs is you want to establish the stakes of your story as early as you possibly can. Um, what the stakes are for your viewpoint character, you know, because if you're reading a story where it seems like the viewpoint character is kind of disconnected and they're not being affected by what's happening, that makes a story a lot less compelling than it could be otherwise. Um, there are certainly some perfectly valid and perfectly functional stories out there where the narrator is basically an innocent bystander. But uh, my take is that most every story is improved if you've got somebody your viewpoint character out of the cast of characters that you could use. You pick a viewpoint character who's really got skin in the game. They've got something to lose. They've got something serious to gain by what's happening. Um, so if you've got a kind of a story forming in your head where you, you envision this cast of characters and you're like, I don't know who to pick as my main character, try to go with a person who's got most at stake. Um, if you possibly can. In some instances, um, for instance, if you need somebody who can provide more of a broad view of what's happening, the person who has the most at stake might not be a viewpoint character. You might need to switch to somebody else who has less at stake, but can who provide more, um, more perspective for the reader than that individual could. But that's one of the important things to decide when you're first you know, landing on what am I gonna write about and who am I gonna write about? Pick the person who's got something to lose or really something to gain and establish what that might be on your first page um, or at least as quickly as you possibly can. And again, that can change over the course of a story. Um, as your story becomes complicated, like say, uh, for instance, your main character you know, want something, they're trying to achieve it, they try a thing, 
which fails and then there are consequences of that failure and the failure might be severe enough that they have to completely discard the thing that they were trying for initially and they have to deal with the consequences of their failure right so all of these things can change as you move along but you need to at least you know set stakes early on um, so that the reader again uh, has a sense of the plot engaging and you know go on from there and that's for short stories you would want to set the stakes of a novel or at least hint at stakes of the novel like in the first chapter. And again, that can change later. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, it looks like um, Sunny had to leave. Um, does anybody have a paragraph that they wanna share or we're coming, we're coming up close on the two hour mark. I don't know if people wanna hang around. Um, I probably can stay on for about another 20 minutes. Um, we can just do a and a we can do whatever y'all like. I have some questions like about um, uh, editing, you know, sure. um, just, I don't know how to, um, I don't know, I spent so much time on editing and really how to do it more effectively. Like maybe we can just focus on the first paragraph, like what types of things should we take out or I don't know, whatever you want to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, self-editing is is tough, and um, this is a little off topic, but I'm happy to talk about it very briefly. It's really easy when you're, you know, beginning pre-professional writer to edit and edit and rewrite and rewrite the same story over and over again. And I think to a certain extent, there's some value in that in the learning process, but I think there's also some value in at some point, you know, finishing. Just say, okay, the story is done now, I need to move on to something else. Um, the most important things um, I would say are paying attention to basic writing mechanics. You know, you can certainly violate the rules of grammar for artistic effect in the story, um, but you wanna make sure that um, the language that you're using communicates what you need it to on a basic level that you're using, you know, semicolons and commas properly, just, you know, basic nitty gritty stuff that you've got words properly spelled if they're intended to be properly spelled. Um, you want to make sure that your prose style, uh, that the language that you're using, uh, that you've used the right words. Um, like, for instance, if you've written tree, like would a more specific word make more sense? Like, saying oak or pine instead of tree, like puts more of an image in the reader's mind. Um, are you engaging with the reader's senses? You know, um, are you relying too much on sight and sound, but you don't have much about how things feel or taste or touch? You know, try to work in sensory details from other senses um, as well. Like the many, many beginning writers tend to lean too much on sight. We, we know a lot about how things look, but we know nothing about textures. Um, it doesn't matter quite so much um, what your character is witnessing as much as it matters how they feel about what they're witnessing. You know, make sure that the details that your character notices matter to that character, that they have some reason for noticing it. Um, descriptive paragraphs are always an opportunity to build in um, your world and characterization. You know, like if you think about um, two people entering a bathroom, one person is an artist and one person is a plumber. The pr plumber is probably going to notice different details about the bathroom than the artist is. Like the artist might be looking at the window going, oh, this place has got really great light where the plumber is going to be like, man, that plumbing is really old. That needs to be replaced. This whole thing needs, you know, refurbishment. Um, so the the witnessing of details matters in terms of who is your character and what would they look like. Um, also in terms of self-editing, like I said, reading things aloud really helps you identify when things aren't flowing right. And, you know, it won't sound right. And sometimes reading it to yourself won't work, but have, you know, a friend or your partner read it to you. Um, but you can, you can just hear so much more than you can necessarily see on the page, particularly if you've read it over and over and over again. Another really easy tactic um, when you're editing a piece that you've finished is switch the font up. Like if you've been composing in Times New Roman, like switch it to Helvetica or Arial. Like a change in font can make you see your prose differently and different things will pop out to you. 
you know, because if you've read through a manuscript over and over and over again, like things that are mistakes will look like they belong there at this point, and it's very, very hard to see them. Um, and past that, um, like I said, um, like boiling words out of a short story uh, can be kind of challenging, uh, but at the short story level, you want to say, you know, is this sentence belonging? Is the sentence doing something to provide characterization? Is it doing something to establish world and setting? Is it doing something to move the plot along? Ideally, it will be doing more than one thing. Um, in a short story, it helps if sentences are doing double duty, like it's moving the plot along, but it's also providing details about characterization. It's describing the world, but it's also providing interesting characterization. Um, you always want to look at your paragraphs, particularly in short fiction, and make sure that there's momentum, that, that you haven't just like brought the plot to a standstill because you're describing an interesting room. Again, this is why, uh, you know, focusing on details that matter to your character for some reason helps maintain plot tension in these otherwise descriptive scenes. As long as there's got momentum and things like that, then, um, you know, you'll be in, in pretty good shape, I think. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Sure thing. Does anybody else have any questions? I have one. Sure. How do you avoid having characters speak the same dialogue? Um, this, this is, again, is worthy of a separate workshop, but um, everybody has their, their, their own vocabulary. Everybody has their own rhythms of speaking. Um, Y'all may have noticed that I speak very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, generally, particularly when I'm excited about something. Um, so, for instance, if you have a character who's very excited, who's very articulate, they might speak in, in very long kind of run-on sentences. Um, if you have another person who's very taciturn, who's very reluctant to speak, they'll speak in much shorter sentences. You know, the vocabulary that somebody uses is going to depend, you know, partly on their education. It's going to depend on what kind of books they read. Um, you know, again, you want to look at your characters, even if somebody is from roughly the same culture, um, you, you will have people from different places in their lives. They'll read different books. They'll have different interests. They'll use different metaphors and different similes. Um, they'll have different ways of viewing the world. So have those ways in which they view the world differently reflected in their speech. Um, Another thing about dialect is a little dialect goes a really, really long way. So use that sparingly, um, because if you kind of overdo dialect, it can make your characters come across as caricatures or stereotypes, and you really want to, you know, steer clear of that. Um, you know, so it it helps to not think of characters say, "Well, I've got my Irishman," or "I've got my Englishman." Um, think of them as there's this character who's a plumber who happens to be from Ireland, you know, think about your character as a whole, as an entire person, and then think about how would they speak? How would they phrase this? You know, you, uh, another thing, and, and it depends on the type of story that you want to write um, and market that you're shooting for. Well, one interesting thing is characters who are full of swearing versus characters who try not to swear. Um, swearing and foul language is often a, a really good stand in for violence. So if you have somebody who's got like violent intent or they're filled with rage, like they're going to swear more, you know, because they can't actually punch somebody, but they might cuss them out. Um, so you can, you can have that going on. Somebody who's maybe filled with a lot of frustration might drop an F-bomb a whole lot more than somebody else who's a lot calmer, who feels a lot more secure, who's not quite so, you know, worked up. Um, you might have a character who enjoys saying shocking things just for the sake of trying to shock other people and trying to get under, under their skin. You know, think about, you know, whether your character's confrontational or not, think about whether they're witty or not. Um, you know, if they're, if they're witty or think they're witty, they might be full of like bad dad jokes if they're not actually very good at it. You know, so just think about who your characters are and have them speak accordingly. Um, and some of this is also gonna uh, tie back into the tone of the story. Um, like we've all seen um, the, sort of the wise cracking sarcastic character who provides comic relief in like a horror movie. Um, if you overdo that, that can really undercut the tension. 
Um, but so again, it's like you can have a character cracking wise inappropriately, but you don't want it to destroy the tension that you're creating by having the sense that, well, this character isn't taking things seriously. They clearly don't feel threatened by this situation. So therefore, I, as the reader, am not taking this situation seriously either. You know, so there's there's kind of a balance to be struck there. Is that helpful, Jack? Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, Bill. OK, yeah, I just thought about um someone carrying on internal dialogues in order to set a stage um, where they're, they're thinking one thing and at the same time, they're having thoughts that represent a different person. So it's like an internal dialogue between two people. It's actually only occurring in one individual's mind. Um, how easy is it to deal with that kind of thing? And is it, how easy is it to overdo it? If you're writing a first with a first person narrator, you can pretty much do as much of that as you want, as long as again, the story's moving forward, you're not like slowing down the plot for, you know, the static monologue. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working uh, with a third person viewpoint, and in particularly if the other character who's not the viewpoint character is, um, you know, hiding something, here's where you want to lean really heavily on nonverbal communication cues. Um, and this is another thing that I've spotted in a lot of the manuscripts that I've worked on is that people will, and even if it's good dialogue, uh, they will have like line of dialogue, line of dialogue, line of dialogue, line of dialogue, and they're not using and taking the opportunity to use any nonverbal communication cues. And by this, I mean facial expression, I mean body language, I mean tone of voice. Like you can do a lot with those tags and action tags to convey that somebody's really lying or they're holding back and things like that. Um, I think with third person, if it's the viewpoint character who's having these inner thoughts, you wanna be more succinct than if you've got a first person narrator, but you can certainly you know, use more. And if the um, main character is witnessing somebody who's acting cagey or who is behaving in ways that belie what they're actually saying out loud. Um, like for instance, if you've got a viewpoint character who's looking at somebody and clearly misinterpreting what's happening, but the reader is cued into what's actually happening, that can create a lot of tension, but that's kind of difficult to pull off a lot of times. Unless like your viewpoint character, somebody who's exceptionally naive, like, you know, a child or somebody else who is, it has a reason to misread what they're looking at, you know, and really don't understand. Does that make sense? It does. I, I opened a story with a situation where someone basically is having thoughts and um, mentally they respond as if somebody else is talking to them. So it's like a dialogue between two people. Mm -hmm. um, but yet at the same time, it's just one person trying to evaluate their position and their situation. That can work fine as long as it's clear to the reader what's happening and as long as the dialogue that is happening is moving things forward. You just don't want to get stuck there where, no, you, no. Got, you know. It, it, it's just a, like if somebody wakes up and they find themselves in a situation and they start mentally talking themselves through it and uh, they start getting responses and directions from another voice in their head, so to speak, uh, okay. based, on their, based on their training and their background. Right, I mean, that could work. Um, you wanna make sure that uh, the reader understands what's happening, that it's moving the story along, that um, everything that's be being said needs to be said. Um, you know, again, you have more latitude um, in a novel versus a short story. In a short story, you really need to condense that type of thing. But, um, you know, as long as your first readers feel like the scene's working, then the scene's probably working just fine. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any other questions? Well, thank you for coming, everybody. I hope you got uh, good stuff out of the session. Thank you for coming. Um, until next month. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was wonderful.